had, who really put into a theological system the charismatic uh, uh, gifts of St. Francis. So he, he sort of put, gave a kind of a theological system to the inspiration of St. Francis in a particular way. Um, I'd like to begin just with a reading from Scripture. This is from the second letter of St. Paul to the Philippians. Have among yourselves the same attitude that is also yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God something to be grasped. Rather, rather he emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, coming in human likeness, and found in human appearance. He humbled himself, becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Because of this, God greatly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend of those in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The word of the Lord. Uh, theologians and scholars of Scripture will tell, you, tell us that that passage, which is the quoting of an ancient hymn, uh, perhaps it, they say possibly even in Jerusalem when the early Christians gathered to celebrate the Eucharist, sung by them, very familiar to St. Paul, and he inserts the text of that famous Christological hymn. It's called, there's several of them in the New Testament to make a specific point about the nature of Christ, uh, that, uh, that the God uh, who was invisible took on flesh, that it is through humility, through obedience to the will of the Father, that his plans were accomplished through the cross. Uh, in the middle of that stanza, there's, uh, the, the hymn is structured. It's called, the, in Greek, the kenosis, a uh, kenotic hymn. Gnosis is a word in Greek for emptying, self-emptying. So it's called the Canonic Hymn. In Latin, it's very famous. It's called the Carmen Christi. It's in our uh, Liturgy of the Hours. You, you hear it, you pray it regularly. It's very important foundationally for the theology of the New Testament because it represents the first way of speaking about the nature of Christ, the first way of speaking about Christology was a comparison between Adam of the Old Testament and what St. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15.45, the new Adam, who is Jesus Christ. Right? And so that the, the first way of speaking about the nature of Christ was simply a comparison between what the old Adam did and what Jesus did. Old Adam disobeyed and it brought death. The new Adam obeyed and it brought life, resurrection. And uh, it was, how was it carried out? Through humility. God humbled himself to enter into human experience, became human, and then he took on uh, death, as uh, the scripture scholars say, he paid the price that he did not owe because we owed a, a debt that we could not pay. Right? They say in famously in Protestant circles. Right? And the, the line, death on a cross, many scholars believe St. Paul actually added that line to the, uh, the canonic hymn, because the cross was so important to St. Paul. And I, I'll refer to that again in a minute. But the cross was at the center of Paul's theology, right? And it, its importance, it was, it was essential in understanding who Christ was, because it was the epitome of his, sac of his, of his ministry. Archbishop Fulton Sheen, careful Archbishop Fulton Sheen, one said that our Lord preached his greatest sermon from the cross. Uh, tomorrow I'm going to get into that a little bit more elaborately. But uh, suffice it to say for today, this theology was so important, and of course it became important for our founder. Uh, in St. Paul's letter to the Galatians in the sixth chapter, he makes a comment that historians and theologians have often wondered about, speculated about, he says, I bear in my body the brand marks of Jesus. And could this be the whippings that he received? Could it possibly be that St. Paul was the first stigmatist, 
we don't know. There, he doesn't mention it anywhere else in terms of his own identification with the cross as a crucified. But uh, there's no art depicting St. Paul that way. If we get to heaven, we'll know if uh, the Apostle Paul was the first stigmatist. But we do know that in the year 1224 on Mount Laverna, our founder was praying and wrapped in a contemplation of the crucified which he said was the greatest act of love. He said, and when he looked at it, and he considered the world that he came from and the world that he lived in at his day, he said, love is not love. Love is not love. Father Angela Shaughnessy, who used to preach these retreats and missions from our province for 40 years, used to give a beautiful conference on love, and he would say that that word is the most overused, abused, and misused word in the modern world, right? And usually when people use it, they mean anything but love. How do you know what love is? You look at a crucifix. Whatever it is, it's an act of sacrifice. It's an act of emptying of oneself. It's an act of giving. It's in no way, and that's, the, that, that's because of the nature of what happened with the crucifixion, the passion and the crucifixion, it became, it's clear to us that whatever love is, it's not for my own gratification, right? It's for the sake of another. This emptying has, has come as an act of giving of oneself. That's love. That's the essence of love. St. Paul would later talk about the characteristics of love in a famous passage when he would say, it's patient, it's kind, it's not conceited, it doesn't put on airs. Those are the characteristics of love. But what is love in its essence? It's the cross and Jesus Christ poured out. So because this event in 1224, you know, St. Francis had the stigmata for two years and two, two days till he died in 1226. But St. Padre Pio, of course, had these wounds for 50 years, from 1918 till he died in 1968. Okay? And, but St. Francis was the first person in history to have the sacred stigmata, the five wounds of the crucified, because that it marked not just the physical body of our founder, it also marked the theological perspective of the order, that it was the charism that St. Francis brought to his own world in the 13th century that initiated real renewal in peace in a chaotic time. Here's what Bonaventure said about that. Just lost my play. Yes. St. Bonaventure said this. The road to this peace is through the most ardent love of the crucified, the sort of love that so transformed Paul into Christ that he declared, with Christ I am nailed to the cross. It is now no longer I that live, but Christ lives in me. And this love so absorbed the soul of Francis that his spirit shone through his flesh the last two years of his life when he bore the most holy marks of the passion in his body. So Bonaventure is linking Francis with Paul, you see, and this early Christian theology. The fathers of the church spoke about the wounds of Christ in a theological terms, of course, being the source of the church's sacraments, especially the Eucharist that flows from the pierced heart of the, of the Savior from his side. But uh, Bonaventure also had a very unique idea about this wound. It, this uh, event of the stigmata marked also the preaching of the early Franciscans. If you're interested in reading more about that, uh, Father Solano from the CFRs, did his doctoral dissertation on that particular topic. And he, he uh, did his dissertation on the early preaching of the Franciscans on the five wounds. Became an early, that was the early devotion of the Franciscan order, reflection on the five wounds, and how those wounds in particular heal various aspects of, uh, of the human sinful uh, you know, acts so through our hands, through our feet, uh, through our thoughts, and things like that. And they would they would do their popular preaching on those kinds of topics. 
And uh, as I said, Bonaventure had a very particular reflection on the wound in the side as being not just a place of gift for us, what we receive, that is specifically the sacraments, but also that the wound in the side becomes a place of entrance for us. He put it this way. He said, Bonaventure, Christ on the cross bows his head waiting for you that he may kiss you. He stretches out his arms that he may embrace you. His hands are open that he may enrich you. His body is spread out that he may give himself totally. His feet are nailed that he may stay there. His side is open for you that he may let you enter there. Right? So that all of these wounds in some way were for us. But the wound in the side for Bonaventure was a particular reflection on a charism of St. Francis. Uh, if, if, you've been to, if you've been to Assisi, raise your hand. If you've been to Italy, you may know what I'm about to tell you. Uh, I had the privilege of being there several times, and one of the things you know if you go through Assisi is the place where Francis actually stayed after his conversion was not in the house in town. He was up at the car tree above the town, and he stayed in what? A cave. A cave. And what many people don't know about our founder is that he spent at least six months out of every year in, in as, as a solitary, right? So this relationship of prayer, action, contemplation, and action came right from the founder. So we're not just uh, we're not just about the ministry. We're also primarily uh, for Francis. It all began with prayer. More the Mary rather than just the Martha, than the Martha, the both, both of those things. But it began as as our Lord said with the first thing, it began with prayer. And it, it was a particular reason why he chose the cave. And that, that I found this interesting. The lecturer that was speaking to us when we were taking the tour of those places said this: that Francis liked to used to stay in the cave for two reasons. One, he had the idea that every crack and every rock on the earth happened at the crucifixion. Did you know that? So Francis thought that. It was in his mind that he, he thought that every crack and every opening and every rock happened at the earthquake that happened at the crucifixion. So going into those places reminded him of our Lord's sacrifice. Then the other thing was that he had this idea that by entering into this cave, you are entering into the wound in the side of Christ. By praying in those places, somehow you are, you are entering into the heart of Jesus, the heart of the Father. Okay? Now, this is theology, and in uh, the second talk, I'm going to get a little bit more into the implications of that, the talk that's on forgiveness. So important for family life and peace uh, in families which lead to a, a reform of the church and the culture. The culture of St. Francis' day was anything but peaceful that he entered into. It was a very tumultuous time. The 13th century, you know, was the height of Christendom. When Innocent III was Pope of the Catholic Church, the Church was at its pinnacle with, with Christendom. That is that for a hundred years prior to the reign of Innocent III, the, the, the Church had been consolidating both ecclesiastical and secular jurisdiction. You know, you know the famous image of the tiara, papal tiara, the three-crowned uh, tiara that the Pope used to wear, representing uh, this both secular and religious authority. And, and so Innocent was at the top of that, the pinnacle of it. Then after him, for a hundred years, started the decline uh, away from the consolidation of both of those uh, of powers. Um, but, you know, and you'd think that when everything was going our way, <laughs> things would be hunky-dory and peachy and everybody would be living virtuous and holy lives. You know, we've got no enemies. We're the biggest show in town. Not so. Not so. Because it was easy to be a Catholic. In fact, there was something in it for you to be a Catholic, right? There was a lot of superficiality. Imagine that in religious observance, right? And not just among, not just accusing the faithful, no, no. Also among the clergy, among everyone, right? There, now, 
At the same time, there were great saints, and we're going to talk about one. But uh, it's not the case that if, if the culture is just always going our way, things will be hunky-dory for the church. We had that moment in history, and it wasn't. And in fact, it was so bad that groups sprung up within the church, heretical groups, right? <clears throat> and reform always comes as a result of bad ideas, heretical ideas, or bad behavior, sinful action. And sometimes they usually go together. And in case of the 13th century, that was certainly the case. Because of the, um, the uh, dissipation, the, the uh, laxity in the discipline, especially of the clergy in the 13th century, different heretical groups broke, broke up that Francis w was the medicine for the real reform that came. Um, the, uh, the groups were known in various regions in Europe as the Cathars or the Albigensians. And some of you already know about them from, uh, from Franciscan history. But these groups had, were rigorous. They were shaved heads, tunics, you know, uh, uh, very ascetical lives, fasted all the time. They were extremely uh, focused on uh, uh, penance themselves and that, uh, and in a very self-deprecating way, you know, which is not really humility. You know, humility, the virtue of humility, is probably most easily described as not thinking less of oneself, but of thinking of oneself less. Right? And this is what Francis brought to the scene in the 13th century. Humility. It was drawn from this theology of Christ who, who humbled himself. You know, Francis was uh, the idea that the all-powerful, the most high, would humble himself to be, take on human flesh as a child, ran against his upbringing instinctively. You know, in the, in the, third, in the Middle Ages, there wasn't uh, like American middle class that we have. You know, there wasn't a middle class. <laughs> there were lords and there were serfs. Okay? You were either a have or a have not. You were either a maggiore or you were a minore. Right? You either lived at the top of the hill or you lived at the bottom of the hill. There wasn't much in between, I will tell you. Now, uh, one of the things they'll tell you when you go to Assisi is uh, these towns are still set up in an evil style. And if, you, if you've been there and you look on the street, in the middle of the street, there's a groove. I don't want to tell you what used to run down that groove because people used to throw it out of the window, right? Which is why women carried parasols in the Middle Ages, okay? And you can only imagine what the town smelled like. And you didn't want to live at the bottom of the hill. That's why you wanted to get to the top of the hill, right? And so the people that lived at the top of the hill were literally called the majore, the majors. The people that lived at the bottom, they were the have-nuts. They were the minores, right? They lived at the bottom. And, uh, and that's where the malaria was, and that's where all the, you know, you didn't want to be down there. So Assisi was uh, an interesting place because it when trade routes to Europe began to open up into Asia especially to get goods and things from like spices and cloth and things from the east. A new exception to the social system began to develop in Europe. Merchants. Merchants. And merchants were like an exception to the established structure. They, they weren't nobility and they weren't exactly serfs because they had money. So they were, there was this thing developing kind of like a middle class. Well, Francis' father was one of those. And he had aspirations. He wanted to break the glass ceiling. He, you know, he wanted to get into the uh, castle up above the, the city, right? And the only way to possibly do that in the Middle Ages was to be successful in war, to battle. The only way you could get a title uh, was to be uh, successful in battle. He couldn't do it himself. He used his son. And uh, this uh, it, uh, effort on the part of Francis's father uh, 
proved to be the cracking point for his son because he was famously involved in a battle with Perugia, the neighboring town. If you've been to Italy, you know the comparison of Perugia and Assisi. Assisi is a commune. Perugia is a city. Okay? It's, that's like comparing you know, uh, Fort Wayne, Indiana to Manhattan, New York. I don't know what you'd compare it to. It's a lot bigger. Okay? And the idea that the Assisians would take on the Perugians was inconceivable. You wouldn't just initiate that. What happened was that the Perugians ran Assisi. Okay? They were the lords of the town. That Raka Maggiore at the top of Assisi, the, the, the noble family that ran the town, the commune of Assisi, was from Perugia. Right? And the local people resented it. They didn't like their town being run by these Perugians. And Francis was in the mob that ran him out of town. They stormed the castle. They drove him out of town. And they tore the place down. He was part of the mob that did that. He would later come back and pick up some of those stones to rebuild the uh, San Damiano Chapel that we see. Some of the stones in that building are with his own hands that he tore down and now he was building up again the, the chapel of San Damiano later in his life, right? So that's what started the war, the conflict, because they, they had rights over that city. They were the nobles. They weren't letting these ruffian, you know, uh, merchants run their own town. You know, you can have that kind of thing. So uh, Francis uh, was in battle with them for over a year. It is impossible to conceive that Francis did not kill anybody in battle during in the course of the entire year. Of course he did. And uh, then he was eventually captured. But uh, it's important to remember that medieval combat used hand tools, knives, swords. Uh, battle in the Middle Ages was up close and personal. And it was bloody and really graphic. And certainly Francis, who had been pampered as much as a medieval young man could be pampered, uh, it was, I'm sure, traumatizing for him. He was just in it for the glory. But he didn't realize the gore you had to go through first before you got there. And when he, he had plenty of time to think about it once he got taken hostage. And uh, they, for he was there for quite a while almost a year, uh, in, their, in their jail cells. And he got sick, and uh, he had, you know, this was the cracking of this, this image that he had of the superficiality of social life. And this was the beginning of his conversion, right? This, this, uh, this physical uh, trauma that he went through, and emotional, psychological trauma. And so uh, this became sort of the foundation for rebuilding his spirituality. And um, so Francis uh, 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 began to pray. He began to ask God for the, open himself to prayer. And it was, for him, that was the, uh, the motivating uh, factor of his life, that he was a man who prayed. That he talked, that he had a constant relationship with God, that he sought always God's will. You know, that was the vision, of course, that he had of uh, whether it was he should pursue earthly honors or uh, heavenly, heavenly glories, heavenly grace. And of course, we know we know how that was decided. Um, how does this uh, how does this spirituality that we share in uh, as a as a legacy for our movement, both first, second, and third order? How does that affect us today in our own culture, and how do we bring how do we bring the spirit of Assisi into our own day? Let me talk a little bit more about say a couple more words about these Albigensians and heretics and what it was in their particular uh, uh, misunderstanding, their heretical views that caused uh, reform in Francis. They had this idea that because uh, uh, that if clergy were living an immoral life, that their, the sacraments that they celebrated or confected would therefore not be valid. If, you know, how could, how, could, 
how could a sinner, a, a smelly, dirty, sinful sinner, make Jesus present on the altar? Just couldn't conceive of it, right? Um, Father Angelus used to say, there's only two sinless people that ever walked the face of the earth. And everyone else, it would be great if God could use angels to confect the sacrament. It's just not possible, right? But uh, uh, some were worse than others. You know, of course, the formation of clergy in the Middle Ages wasn't what we have today. It wasn't systematic through seminaries. Like any other profession in the Middle Ages, if you wanted to do something, you apprentice. So you would go to the local priest and spend time with him, and he would teach you what it meant to be a priest. Uh, if he had, if he was a good Latinist, you'd learn Latin. Well. If he had good spirituality, you'd, you'd learn spirituality, you'd learn to pray. If he wasn't, it was spotty. So it wasn't that everybody was bad or that everybody was great. It was just uneven. This was one of the reforms that came out of the 16th century with the establishment of the seminary system. But then it was different. And some priests barely knew enough Latin to say Mass. And, you know, their moral life was sketchy. The, the big sins at the time was concubinage, priests with having concubines in them, and simony, the sale of uh, spiritual goods and the privileges, uh, things like that. Uh, offices in the church, that's all called, the, it's a crime, it's a canonical crime, a simony. It's pretty rampant in the Middle Ages. And just this general lack of discipline, lack of formation, led to all this stuff. So these, these albigensians and Catholics supposed that the sac sacraments they uh, confected were invalid, uh, illicit, invalid. Uh, so they were depriving the faithful of the sacrament. The very thing that Christ died for on his side, and these terrible sinners are preventing the people from access to the sacrament. So they took it upon themselves in many cases, not just to become judge and jury, but in, in, in many cases, Executioners, and they, they would execute clergy. They felt that they deemed were living immoral lives, and uh, and so the uh, when Saint Francis, who was also a penitent, as we heard, uh, and, and a penitent, uh, went in front of the Pope, he looked like them. He looked like these Catholics and Albigenses, and the Pope was suspicious of him because of it. But then he had this famous dream that Francis. It wouldn't be till the Fourth Lateran Council in 1215 that the Church would finally decide on this matter with the famous axiom in Latin, ex opere operato, when it came to the nature of the sacrament and their, their permanence regardless of the moral state of the ministry. St. Francis had a different way of illustrating this through action. And of course there's the famous story of uh, St. Francis walking through a town where there was a, a Poor priest was living as they say a dissipated life, as it says in the theory, and who knows what that meant. And they dragged this poor man out to the street to town people to see what St. Francis would do. They knew what the Catholics, the Abigensians, would do. St. Francis went up to the man and knelt down, and took his hands like on the day of his ordination, and kissed the palms of his hands. He said, Of this man's life I know nothing. I do not know, but I only know that through his hands I received the body and blood of our Savior Jesus. It was his way of saying, you know, that if a, if a, if a priest or a minister would, would dare to celebrate the sacrament in a state of mortal sin, he would have felt faster than anybody else in the church. Uh, the faithful are not deprived of the sacrament because of that. And so Francis had a different way. It is said that that priest in the theoretic was converted on the spot and, and led a reformed life moment of that encounter with St. Francis, right? That uh, that was the medicine that Francis poured on the particular wounds of scandal and sin in his own day. Uh, and also his life of prayer was a witness to the people of his day who were more concerned about the um, ostentation of affluence and wealth as it related to their relationship to the church or what they or, or the status that they gain by being associated with the church in some way or another, and Francis had this as this opposite way of of uh, approaching the Lord, and that was very much in the church. He was very much 
an Orthodox Catholic. Uh, Father Morris Sheehan, one of the famous friars of my province who taught Franciscan history for years and years, he was the warden at Grey Friars Hall at Oxford, I was head of the Franciscan school at Oxford. He used to say, you can't understand St. Francis unless you understand three things about him. He was medieval, uh, he was Catholic, right? and he was Italian. He said, if you don't understand those three things, you can't understand the saint, right? And he was, his way of uh, pouring medicine on the wounds of the body of Christ was through an affective spirituality. It came from the heart of the Father, Bonaventure. When I was a novice, uh, Father Bob McCreary, who was our uh, very famous uh, theologian, and in, in the, most of the bishops know him, he was our provincial for many years, a very holy man. He lives with us now in Pittsburgh in retirement. We're graced with his presence. You can just see him. He just, he's a very holy man. And uh, he, he said to somebody who asked how he was doing, he says, I'm fading gracefully away. He said, I was standing with him at Ford Field for the beatification of Solanus Casey in 2017. I was sitting next to each other, the two of us, and we're standing there in the stadium before the mass began. Father. McCurry is looking around at the stadium like all these people, because he was alive when Father Shalanus was alive. And he's just shaking his head. Like, you know. In this day and age, in our culture, there's such cynicism about faith and the church and clergy and everything else. And this place is filled to the rafters. 80,000 people, they, they had the, uh, the altar on the... Uh, ground, and that's why there's just that many people in there. And Archbishop Vigran said he could have filled that stadium three times. The old football stadium the Detroit Lions. I mean, with all due respect to the Detroit Lions, they've never filled that stadium. And it was raining. It was sheets of rain. And in our day, in this culture, if it's even a little bit of gentle rain, people cancel, right, on everything. You try to get a meeting when it rains. Like, you know, do you have a car? Do you have an umbrella? You know, uh, it was, I mean, coming down in sheets, and it was freezing. It was November. I mean, it was, right? Uh, everyone was, it was just, and people came. The place was packed, packed with people. Little priest who wasn't even a full priest died in 1957, right? And there they are, sanctity. It's not just attractive, it's effective. Even in the culture of our day. Okay, I'd like to end this little talk, conference, with a couple of simple reflections on the importance of what you do living this charism today in our culture, how this theology perhaps applies to us today. Uh, Dr. Ralph Martin, who is on the faculty of Sacred Heart Major Seminary in, uh, for the Archdiocese of Detroit, recently published a book called A Church in Crisis. I recommend the book. I read it in like four days. Couldn't put it down. Uh, it was uh, putting everything in a nutshell. I mean, it's mostly stuff that I, I know, I'm aware of, but he just puts it like in a real nutshell. And essentially what he says there in the book is, it, and it's subtitled Pathways Forward. So that's what I want to be concerned with in my last point. So it's hopeful, but it's a sober assessment of where we are in our own culture today. And there's a lot of similarities. Of course, you know, that's why I recited some of the medieval history. There we can see obvious, obvious parallels to Francis Day. Um, the sin of the culture at the moment is a heresy. It is basically this. If you survive life, you, I mean, life is hard enough. You know, all this penance and all that stuff. <laughs> if life is hard enough, if you survive life, you get the golden ticket, right? Right? I mean, uh, everybody basically goes to heaven. It doesn't really matter what religious group you belong to or don't belong to. It doesn't matter what you say. It doesn't really matter what you do. Um, essentially, when you die, you go up, right? Now, that's an interesting, perhaps, and consoling thought. It just happens to be the opposite of what Jesus said, right? That's Martin's point. He's a charismatic Bible guy, right? He's all about the scriptures. 
And he said, you know, our Lord said that the, path, the way to perfection is narrow. Very few choose to follow it. He said the way to perdition is wide. And, and many people choose to follow that. The heresy of our day is the exact opposite of the gospel. It's the anti-gospel. Right? It's the antithesis of the gospel. Right? Okay. So Francis found that narrow path of perfection. How did he find it? It was through humility. I would suggest to you that the, the heresy, the dominant heresy of our culture today, um, underlying it is a capital sin, a uh, cardinal sin. That's an, that's an interesting, important, and evocative word. The word cardo in Latin means hinge, like on a door. So St. Thomas Aquinas said that when one uh, intentionally commits a card, one of the cardinal sins, and you don't have to remember these, but it's all on the flyer that's down there for you for you to take it if you need just a little reminder in the next door. That the intentional committing of any of the cardinal sins opens the door to the rest of the devils. Okay? So that when one gives in to it, that's why they're called cardinal sins, because all of them do that. If you if you give in to any one of them intentionally, right, it just opens the door to the other six. All right. And I would suggest to you that the dominant sin of our culture today, and I, a lot of people are writing about it and preaching about it today, is this. Apathy. Apathy. You know, it's I, I, don't, I don't have time to pray. I don't care to pray. If religion works for you, that's your truth. That's good for you. It doesn't work for me. Don't I don't see where it fits into my life. I've got everything I need. I've got my car. I've got my house. I've got a bank account. Uh, I, you know, what do I need? What do I need with all this? You know, that's a, that's a, that wasn't always a moment in our culture. I said in our small group earlier this morning, you know, before the Second World War, people did not think like that, right? You had the Great Depression. You had the, the stress of the Second World War. People were pretty focused. There's nothing like a war to get people focused spiritually, right? The problem is you can win the battle and lose the war. Right? And our culture has been sort of skating along ever since really that era, through the 50s, the glorious 50s, and then, you know, the, the opulent, the decadence of the 60s and 70s, and it sort of led to where we've come today. And it's just basically, you know, religious affiliation is not that important. Uh, just some statistics for you. That um, when I was a child growing up in Canton, Ohio, Mother Angelica's hometown, uh, Catholics in the United States went, went to church at a rate of about 75 to 80 percent. So 75 to 80 percent of Roman Catholics go to church on Sunday. Okay. Um, now, for the last 20 years, uh, the, well, Catholic weddings have decreased 60,000 every year for the last 20 years, including Catholic school every four days. Okay. Um, mass attendance nationally right now is at about 12 percent. For every one person that uh, comes into the church, six leave. Uh, over 85% of our young people leave the church by the age of 20 in the United States. This shows a real lack of obvious, dramatic lack of enthusiasm for religious practice. Now, in fairness, it's kind of across the board. You know, religious practice, regardless of if even the Protestant denominations have declined, you know, in large numbers. I mean, just raise your hand if you think our culture is sicker for the lack of religious practice in our country. Quick survey, right? Right, I would agree with you, right? But that's become the norm. It's become the norm in our culture. People aren't praying, they aren't seeking the grace. Even exorcists, famous ones, to name a few of them, they'll tell you that it's getting much more complicated in the work they do because there are less masses being said. Less people, you know, every, every exorcist will tell you that the sacrament of confession is way more powerful than any exorcism, right? Because it's a person intentionally willing, confessing their sins, asking for grace, right? A lot of the times with the, with the exorcism ceremonies, you have to beat it out of the, the devil out of them in a way, you know? They participate, but he, all of them will say, but there's less people going to confession. 
right? Uh, there's less rosaries being prayed. There's less people, you know, when I was a newly ordained priest before I went off to the missions, I was stationed briefly in the city of Philadelphia at St. John the Evangelist in Center City. And it's kind of a shrine church. And in the lower church, we have confessionals, weird confessions most of the day. And those people in Philadelphia, those IHM nuns, they did a good job on the, on the parochial school Catholics in Philadelphia. Because I remember at any age, people coming in and regularly saying, forgive me, Father, I failed to say my morning or evening prayers today. It's the precept of the church to pray. It's not like it's nice if you have time to do it. It's actually a, it's a mortal sin not to pray, not just for us. It's soul destroyed. When you don't pray, you, you, you take away your soul. Right? But how many people even think they have a problem when they fail to pray? They just don't even think that, don't even know that it's sinful not to pray. So St. Francis had an ah, uh, an ah, uh, 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 the counter inspiration. G.K. Chesterton, you know, who one of St. Francis' biographers, who loved St. Francis, he knew that the inspiration lied in St. Francis for authentic cultural renewal. And he said this. He said the natural virtues or the, the, um, the cardinal virtues are uh, reasonable, he said. But the specifically Christian, the theological virtues, the faith, hope, and charity, Chesterton said, are unreasonable. And he said, love means forgiving the unforgivable, or it is no virtue at all. Hope means hoping when things are hopeless, or it's no virtue at all. And faith means believing the incredible, or it's no virtue at all. Generosity. Generosity. Francis's response was, was not just one of self-deprecation, uh, uh, one of sadness and... and uh, uh, you know, o over the condition. He also reflected on creation as beautiful, remember. You know, he saw that, cre that even we could be beautiful if we were but obedient to the will of God. That's all that it takes. It takes in us the redevelopment of the virtue of humility. In our culture today, this sin of slow, uh, I think is that the, the, uh, they call it spiritual apathy, Right? Asidia uh, is the proper word for it in Greek. Uh, uh, Saint Bernard of Clairvaux and uh, the ancient monks called it the noonday devil. Right? Everybody experiences this. Even those of us who are committed to being praying people, we can experience this. Uh, a number of years ago, I was on a retreat down at the uh, famous Abbey of Gethsemane outside of Louisville, Kentucky. And, you know, the monks there... They uh, make different products to support their life as a monastery. Teas and uh, fudge and fruitcake. And I will tell you, though, they're wicked. And the secret to the fudge and the fruitcake, uh, you want to know the secret is? They infuse them with Kentucky bourbon. <laughs> so one of the monks is giving me a tour of the monastery. And he takes me in his room and says, Father, now, that's the machine that injects the bourbon into the fruitcake. <laughs> he said, now, some days I feel like putting my face under there. <laughs> the long journey does affect us. You know, we do become weary from day to day. How do we renew our enthusiasm that St. Francis had? Well, the, 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 the cardinal, ver, uh, cardinal sins have what they call corresponding virtues that heal the cardinal sins. The corresponding virtue to slows is diligence. Diligence. Okay? And let me give you a good definition of this virtue, this particular virtue. Okay, diligence is defined as careful and persistent effort or work. The effort, puts, the effort one puts toward balanced and holistic development in mental, physical, social, and spiritual dimensions. Um, the development, redevelopment of the virtue of diligence is what is really needed among us as, as Christians today. Div diligence in our Christian lives. Archbishop uh, Chaput said that uh, 
the, um, uh, the uh, ability to master oneself, and Padre Pio often reflected on this, that he, Padre Pio said our greatest spiritual battle is with ourselves, overcoming our impulsiveness, overcoming our tendencies towards sin, you know, which are twofold. St. Thomas described the effect of original sin as being a darkening of the intellect, a weakening of the will, so that we don't see things the way they are, we see them the way we want to see them, and we just have a tendency as human beings to do and say sinful things. Self-mastery, the development of the, of, the, of the virtue of diligence, is what helps to counteract. It's sort of the medicine that's poured on the wound that creates the cultural heresy of our day. And uh, my hand in there. I probably messed it up. Okay. Okay. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. All right. So, uh, to uh, pride, obviously, obviously, is the the corresponding sin to humility. So, these are, are related. It's interesting that in the month of June, we celebrated an entire month of a cardinal sin. The culture celebrated, not just committed, celebrated a cardinal sin. Pride. Right? Um, that's, that is a, a symptomatic of, a, of, of the illness, the spiritual illness going on in the culture. So how do we redevelop, where is the medicine for the healing? It's found in the, in the uh, virtue of, the corresponding virtue of humility. And uh, Archbishop Chaput also wrote a, a book recently uh, on this cultural phenomenon, and he called, he, it's entitled, um, uh, Things Worth Dying For, Living the Catholic Faith in Difficult Times. In challenging times, I also highly recommend that this book. It's a uh, it's a, another take on this same phenomena going on in the culture, but it really has to do with a lack of self discipline, self control. That just seems to be uh, antithetical. People in our culture today just react to the idea of self control. You know, the the cultural moment is he who dies with the most stuff wins, right? The idea that you would you would limit yourself, intentionally limit yourself, that you would not have the nicest uh, cell phone, that you would not buy the nicest car, that you would give away the things that you don't need, uh, that, that you would even go beyond that to dip into your own needs for the sake of someone else. That He also a prior of my province, uh, and uh, he and Cardinal O'Malley actually. Described as 
moralistic therapeutic deism, right? And it ha he identifies uh, five points of this sort of pseudo religion uh, uh, with these following five points. You know, the, you hear it in the culture today. I'm spiritual, but not religious. Right? You've heard that, right? But it's an interesting comment because the uh, that is a perfect definition of the devil. Okay, he's an angel. He's a he's a hundred percent spiritual. Okay, hates religion. Ah, false religion, distorted. Ah, it's a tool in his plate. I mean, people die with that. He loves that. But the authentic religion, a, a sincere, honest, humble religious faith. Devil hates that. He's the definition of being spiritual but not religious. So here's the following five cultural points. Quote, a God exists who created and orders the world and watches over human life on earth. He wants people to be good, nice, fair to each other, as taught in the Bible and most world religions. Central goal of life is to be happy and to feel good about oneself. God does not need to be particularly involved in one's life except when he's needed to resolve a problem. And finally, good people go to heaven when they die. Okay? That kind of puts it in a nutshell. Uh, it's called moralistic therapeutic deism. It's an uncontrolled uh, self, right? St. Augustine said, master yourself and the, and the world is yours, right? Self-mastery. This is, this is what, it's not about bondage. It's not about rules. It's ab in fact, it's about the opposite. It's about liberation. You know, Father Solanus Casey was not only liberated in his own spirituality, but he was so perfected in it that just his physical touch of people healed them. That grace was so present in Father Solanus that, and Pad Padre Pio we'll talk about later, but this, this goal that we're all seeking, this liberation, spiritual liberation, they had so, like, put away any distraction to it they so focused on it, they were so liberated personally that, that there was overflow of it to the people that they came in contact with. I was just down in Cincinnati, and uh, I was preaching a parish mission at uh, the oratory, St. Old St. Mary's in Cincinnati, and there's a little group of Carmelite sisters in the parish, and one of the sisters came up to me after the talk on Father Solanus, and she said, uh, Father, my, my aunt met him on the street up in, on Mount Elliott Street in Detroit, St. Bonaventure's um, Priory back in the 50s. And she said, my aunt... And very gesture, I, she complained about it to Father Solanus, and he said, oh, let me see that. So they took him to the room and he put his arthritic sister said he made a quiet gesture of blessing and uh, left the room. Said immediately when he blessed, it started to drop. By the next day, there was no sign of the infection, never had a recurrence of the infection. And I will tell you that for Father Solanus, that was a Thursday evening. 
I mean, things like that happen multiple times a day. I'm getting to believe that rain is a sign of Father Solana somehow. <laughs> but uh, uh, multiple things, li things like that happen multiple times a day at the Friary at St. Bonaventure. Uh, this is the medicine uh, of a soul sanctified by prayer. You know, Father used to spend hours on his knees in front of the Blessed Sacrament. And after night prayer, we Capuchins had the custom uh, before night prayer of doing uh, the, uh, the, the uh, uh, faults, chapter of faults. And we would kneel with our arms out like this and, and confess our sins within the community. After Compline was over, many times Father would go, uh, when the friars were all going to bed, he would go up to the wooden steps of the altar on the cloistered side of the chapel, and he would kneel there on his arthritic knees on the bare wooden floor with his arms out like this for five, six, seven hours like this. And he just stared at the, at the tabernacle. Uh, Father Benedict said they, they would just do this in front of him. He wouldn't even blink. You know, just like in a trance, at uh, uh, looking at the, in this custom we used to call extendus manibus, you know, open your arms. So he'd kneel like this for hours. And many times the friars in Detroit would say they found him in the morning, collapsed on the floor, he'd slept there all night, and they'd say, Father, could we at least get you a pillow? And, and he said, would say, no, thanks, I slept on the soft part of the board just to be present there to Jesus, right? That the, the, the secret to unlocking the kind of liberation that is so manifested in the saints is capable for you. Prayer. Prayer. The sacrament, right? What Our Lady was through a provenient act of grace, we become through the sacrament. We enter into the heart of Jesus. We enter into the heart of the mystical heart of the Father. He has this ability to do what I'm going to talk about in the next conference. But that is the medicine. Rededicating ourselves to prayer. And, and through just a diligent, whether you're a monastic, whether you're a secular living in the world, redoubling our efforts to the regularity of our prayer life is re and sacramental life is the access to grace. Both, sac both sanctifying and actual. end with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Most high, all glorious, and good God, enlighten the darkness of our hearts and grant us right faith, sure hope, perfect charity, wisdom and knowledge, Lord, that we may know and carry out your most holy will. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord. Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit.